So I was invited to write a play for a kid from the 52nd Street Project. I'd never had kids of my own, and while I was around them here and there, I wasn't so sure I liked them all that much, and for all I knew, they probably didn't like me either. But the experience I had writing for and subsequently performing with a seven-year-old boy from Hell's Kitchen changed the course of my life. As a former prisoner, I have personally experienced a sense of fear and hopelessness in being homeless upon being released from prison. I have also experienced the vicious cycle of addiction, violence, incarceration, and know firsthand how difficult it is to break free of this cycle, especially without getting help or support. I have learned that there is always more to do, so pace yourself to prevent burnout. You can't do everything yourself. You can't be everything to everyone. Change happens over time. Be patient and don't forget in the meantime that we all have a part to play. I choose to do this work in Bull Heights in East Los Angeles because I want my work to impact the lives of families in the community where I was born and raised. I grew up in a two-bedroom bungalow in East LA that my parents bought in 1965. There was no private space in the house. The bedroom that I shared with my brother and sister was more like a hallway than a private bedroom. My parents would have to walk through our room to get to their bedroom, and everyone would have to walk through our room to get to the bathroom. The kitchen table was the only decent place to do homework. We had no choice but to concentrate above the noise emanating from the pots and pans being washed and novelas blaring from the television nearby. As a child, I had no idea that my living situation could be different. I only knew that this was my home and it felt safe. As modest and lacking in privacy as it was, our little house on Folsom Street provided me with a stability that many of my peers did not have. At a very young age while growing up in Hawaii, I realized how powerful art could be as a catalyst for presenting challenging perspectives, creating dialogue, and giving voice to an idea or experience. The lack of visibility of Asian Pacific artists and experiences in the arts and media motivates my work at East West Players. As a college student in the late 1960s, I volunteered in Chinatown with others like me, Chinese Americans from immigrant families, seeing the struggle of our parents and feeling our own struggle with identity and legitimacy as people of color in a society that hadn't delivered on its promise of equality and social justice. My father quotes to me a Chinese saying that the work is longer than the life, and indeed, there is much work still for me to do. For 25 years, I've worked beside poor people who organize their neighbors and co-workers to fight for decent housing, jobs, and a better life. I've seen them light up a room with their intelligence and vision, and then go back to jobs where they push a broom or wait tables and are made invisible by middle-class people who pass them by. It's hard to stand idly by when society's inequalities are so clearly visible. What began as a simple short-term internship assignment turned into an almost 14-year love affair with this neighborhood and the young people and families who live here. I've learned a great deal about life and myself from people who've been largely written off by our society because they may be poor. Through their example, I've learned what it means to be a good neighbor, to share with others, and to respect and value diversity of cultures and lifestyles. I began my involvement in community-based service and volunteerism during my experiences as an undergraduate at UCLA when I participated in the Filipino-American student organization Samahang Filipino. That period of student activism has proved to be the most important and defining period of my life. I didn't come to the work. The work came to me, and my life has been blessed because of it. At Mother's Club, I saw the challenges facing our families and their great and earnest desire to make good lives for themselves and their children. And I had no choice but to do the very best I could to create and sustain this place that they depended on. It has been fun and scary and impossibly rewarding. I've learned that change is a process that happens over time. Sometimes it seems to lie dormant, then it emerges. 
then it seems to stop. Then all of a sudden, there it is. This holds true for a child who is learning to be independent, for a mother who is learning English, for an organization that is developing a new program, and for a community that is struggling to create change. It is a vital part of the Son Jarocho tradition to teach, to share, to pass on to future generations of Jaraneros and to other musicians the music, the dance, the verses, the culture, and the fandango. This is how music has been kept alive for over 400 years. Musicians, dancers, children, adults, and elders participate in sharing, expressing themselves, in showing off what they've learned, or just listening and watching. It is a celebration of who we are, where we came from, and of what we are holding on to by passing it down. All the arts for all students. I recite these words on a daily basis, but it's the students themselves and my own experience that keeps me engaged in this work. When I faced a class of fourth graders as a visiting dance artist in a rural Maine community 25 years ago, I recognized the power of artistic experience in an educational setting. Watching Danielle spin her way out of shyness and Mark and Randy begin to make artistic choices with a beginning, middle, and ending dance. And Mrs. Wilson, the teacher, witnessing her students joyfully embracing the learning experience. These students were learning about dance concepts, space, time, and force, about creative solutions and physical confidence. And yes, they were also learning about fractions and verbs. I was born in Pazarzik, Bulgaria, in a small town at the heart of the Trace region. I was raised in a family of workers where Bulgarian music played a huge role in bringing family and friends together. Both my parents worked so hard, but my favorite part of the day was when they came back home and started playing music. Every day, I'm inspired by the fact that I'm working to clean up Southern California's coast and millions of people want and need for this resource to be protected and restored. I believe that I'm engaged in my current field of work because of my experience as an immigrant who has developed appreciation for the ideas of democracy and self-determination by which this country is built. I sit in my office around the corner from my childhood home and three blocks away from where I was introduced to the struggles for social justice and equity. It was 1972. My older brothers had left our one-bedroom Pico Union apartment on Arapaho Street for college and were introducing into our home their newfound politics from campus life. Inspired by their sons and frustrated with the conditions at our grammar school, Magnolia Avenue Elementary, my parents joined others and formed Padres Unidos and were determined to hold the school district accountable. So began my commitment to social justice and education. My passion for the arts was the heart of my involvement as a teatrista, artist, writer, and a street poet. Lessons learned include the most resonant discovery after a lifetime of creating, that the best is yet to come. I started working on social justice issues a few years after I arrived into the United States from Mexico. For me, my relationship to my work and the community that I work for is like a marriage. I made the commitment a long time ago and it has been part of my life ever since. My father was a minister. My mother was an elementary school teacher. I was raised with the idea that service to the community was a worthwhile and important goal. Since I was young, when my grandmother and grandfather drove me in their pickup truck over the back roads in Northern California, seeing old covered bridges, historic towns, and rustic farms, and sharing stories of when they first came to the state, I have treasured the built environment and the role it plays in conveying personal and community memories. I learned early in my life that by preserving historic places, we preserve our memories and culture. My family has always had a social conscience. I believe in a society in which health care is a right, just as education, quality child care, and other services should be. 
My father, a retired social worker, taught me and my three siblings the importance of community service. I saw him work tirelessly with families and children in need. He did so with respect and regarded the opportunity to help others as an honor. His example of recognizing and acknowledging the good and value in others is a lasting and guiding impression. Contrary to popular rhetoric, I believe we have the resources to end hunger, educate all our children, and support our families through building healthy communities. I've dedicated my life to helping demonstrate this reality. I've learned that the journey is often more important than the destination. I've learned that the challenges that life presents are the context in which we define ourselves and build integrity. I have learned that every person I meet contributes to our understanding of life and that I need to slow down, be present, and listen. In 1979, I was part of a group that founded a new organization called the Little Tokyo Service Center, and I was hired to be the first executive director. It was the job of my dreams, and I ignored the fact that the organization had no other staff, no secure funding, and no track record, because I was excited to be working in the community. I've learned that if we ask for help, people will respond. I do this work not only because it is interesting and challenging and meaningful every day, but also because when I was 15 years old, I accompanied my mother to the police station to get a restraining order against her husband, my stepfather, who had beaten her. I have learned firsthand that violence doesn't happen just to other people or to other families. It happens to our own. I've learned that I can't do it all and that I can't do it alone. I've learned that I'm not always as patient as I should be, but that impatience is not necessarily bad. I've learned that when I don't take care of myself, not only does my back go out and I can't walk, but that people who depend on me can't. I've learned that laughter is indeed the best medicine for everything. I love to laugh, and making people laugh is one of my greatest pleasures. Once I got a fortune in a fortune cookie that said, when you tell people the truth, make them laugh or they will kill you. I believe this to be true. I have learned that we all need a time and place in which to address our inner lives, to escape from the congestion of the city, to hear ourselves think, and to be able to feel in a different way, to connect to forces greater than ourselves. I believe strongly in the transformational power of nature, wilderness, and open space. As our lives become increasingly complex and our cities increasingly crowded, people need breathing room more than ever before. I've chosen to cast my lot in this community, for it is where I have found my passion and joy, as well as the very face of God in the struggle of the poor. I have learned a great deal in these many years working with gangs. I see now how the violence which grips us still is more symptom than problem. Above all, I have seen that the day won't ever come when I have more courage, honor, and proximity to God than these young men and women I've been privileged to know.